Good afternoon and welcome here. I would like to start my presentation uh, by thanking Lisa, Lisa Brower, the president of Linda Hall Library and the fellowship program for giving me the opportunity for being here for two months, doing research and learning a lot. I would also like to thank Donna Switcher for being so kind and helpful in preparing my stay. I also would like to thank to the team of History of Science Department for their daily support, Bruce Bradley, Cindy Rogers, Nancy Officer, and Bill Ashworth. And last, but not the least, I would like to thank all the staff of Linda Hall for their friendly attention and help with books uh, and pictures. Thank you. In the last years, natural disasters seem to be everywhere, especially in the media. We have films, books, newspapers, and TV news about natural disasters. We all know a couple of them in the last years. And in the media, they always look like the worst, the biggest, and the worst. In fact, it's very common to heard, never seen anything like this. It looked like that in the 20th century, natural disasters became more frequent and bigger. And normally, this is connected with global climate change and the mean sea level rise. But in fact, global climate change and the mean sea level rise do not explain everything. Climate phenomena normally is studied by natural scientists. So people ask me very regularly why an historian concerned about these issues. And this is because in the last century, human activity had had more impact on coastal systems than climate change. In fact, we can no longer speak about natural coasts. With few exceptions, we have man-made coasts. This lecture is about human and environment interactions. Using Europe and USA historical examples and analyzing them in a long-term perspective, I will talk about how perceptions and uses shaped the 20th century shores how human actions contributed to, the, to the enhancement of natural risks, and what strategies were developed to protect against the sea dangers. In the end, I hope to show you why history matters in coastal area issues. For a very long time in Europe, the sea was a dangerous place. The sea was the last place of the unknown, the place, the last vestige of the, the, the biblical deluve, and the place where God kept all the monsters. So people were afraid of the sea. In the Portuguese popular tradition, we have a lot of songs, tales, legends, and superstitions about these dangers of the sea. And we have a proverb that is common to several countries in Europe that says, if you wish to learn to pray, set out to the sea. For a very long time, the seashore, because it's the border between the sea and the land, was a, a territory of dread and appreciation, death and survival. And in the Portuguese coast, and also in other coasts in Europe, there are very specific dangers that explain why people were afraid of the sea and of the coastline. We had pirates in Portugal until the end of the 18th century. We had Vi the Vikings, the English, the French, the Dutch, and in the 18th century it was especially the Moors that came from the north of Europe. And they attacked towns, they killed people, and in some cases they take people as slaves to the north of Europe. And we also have a long history of shipwrecks, of ships lost when they're trying to enter or getting out of harbors, and of fishermen 
dying so near of the coast, because in the Portuguese coast, where we don't have harbors, it's extremely difficult to pass from the beach into the ocean, especially you, when you have to pass the surf zone. It's very easy for the small boats of fishermen like this one to be turned over and all the fishermen to die very near the shore. And then we also have storms. The coasts are very su susceptible to weather and to wind, and we have big storms in our country. So, in fact, for a very long time, the coast was an hostile territory. And nevertheless, it was also an attractive territory because it was a place for fishing, collecting seafood, seaweed, and, drink, uh, and drift wood. So it's like a place, like I said before, of death and survival. So while, how did people defend it from coastal dangers? It's very simple, by not living there. <laughs> In fact, historical sources show us two kinds of settlement until the 19th century. There were the sheltered coasts and the open coasts. One example of sheltered coast is Lisbon. People were living in sheltered coasts, the histories of, riv of, yes, the histories of rivers and protected bays for centuries. We have here the case of Lisbon. Lisbon is in here. It has developed in the mouth of the Tagus River. It is very near the sea, it has good access, but it's not in the shore. And then we have another case. This is the lagoon of Aveiro. People live here for centuries, but they don't live in the coast. They live in the inland part of the lagoon. All this coast over here that is open and exposed to big waves and storms, was almost deserted until the 19th, the 19th century. So people were living in communities inland, like this one, Mira, and in the summer, a part of these communities went to the seashore for fish. They only lived there in the summer, and they built small communities that they abandoned in the winter. It was a seasonal occupation in all this area of the Portuguese coast until the 19th century. And it was very curious to find that in the United States we ha you have a similar situation. In fact, Silgo, Silgo says, from the first years of the settlement until the middle of the 19th century, New Englanders dreaded of coastal zones as a wilderness beyond their capacity to shape and to cultivate. Long after the transformation of the forest's wilderness into farmland and villages, the entire New England coast remained as an objectification of chaos. So this doesn't happen only in Europe, but it also happened in America. The coast was a place of fear. And we have the example of Cape Cod. If you look into the, the history of Cape Cod, it's a history of storms, wrecks, and death. In fact, when the, first, when the pilgrims arrived, they didn't stay in the hook of Cape Cod. They went to Plymouth because it's more sheltered. If you look into the, all the towns of Cape Cod, they developed in here, inside the bay. They are not exposed to the sea. Dwight was in Cape Cod in the beginning of the 19th century, and he describes the region as a wild, dreary, and inhospitable, where no human being could dwell. In Turo, he was there later, and he says it's a wild, rank place, and there is no flattery in it. The carcasses of men and beasts, because he was talking about shipwreck, together lie stately up upon its shelf, rooting and bleaching in the sun and waves. There is naked nature, inhumanly sincere, wasting no thought on man. There is one kind of danger that we hardly hear to speak about. I'm talking about 
the sands, the drifting sands. For a very long time, in some places of the shore, the sands were more danger than the sea. I'm talking about big fields of dunes that, in those times, were considered a naked territory, a scary desert, a useless and dangerous place, because those dunes, blown by the wind, could bury fields, houses, churches, and were converting inhabited areas into barren and deserted lands. And we have examples of this, almost since the 18th century, in no, 16th century in England, in France, in Portugal, we have one village, Lavos, that the population had to move twice because of the sands were encroaching the houses, and the, they had to rebuild the church twice because of the sands. And even in Brazil, I was in Brazil last month, and I heard that they have the same problem nowadays in some parts of the coast. This is an example of Portugal, of the dune encroachment towards house. And here, it's a dune field invading uh, another country uh, or field. This happens also in Cape Cod. In fact, the town of Provincen, the province town that is here on the Uk Uk of Cape Cod was the last one to be created. Because this is a very hostile territory, all of this is composed of sands. There is no soil in this area. So the first, but the, the harbor of Cape Cod is one of the best. So to settle people on this area, the first inhabitants had special privileges. They were free of duty of taxes, there is very important, and military duties. And what happened? People created a town of province town, but soon the sands, all the sands, started to encroach the town and silting the harbor. Why? According to the first explorers, all this area used to be a woody area. But then the people cut the woods. And normally, the inhabitants of Cape Cod used to send their cattle to be raised here, and the cattle eat all the vegetation. So the, the sands blown by the wind started to move towards Provincetown and the harbor. The government of Massachusetts, to preserve the harbor, forbidden the, ca the cattle for being raised in here, and for some time, the inhabitants of Truro, that's a city, a town in here, had, were forced by law to plant beach grass. Beach grass is a pioneer plant that grows in the dunes, and it helps to immobilize them with their roots. But this death was not enough, because one century later, in the 19th century, the government of Massachusetts had to take another measure. So they decided to plant, to do a systematic plant of beach grass in all this area. And these plantations continue all along the 20th century to stop and to prevent the sands from moving and destroying the harbor. We have examples like that in Portugal. Andrade Silva was one of the first to speak about the necessity in Portugal of planting the dunes to immobilize the sands. He had been traveling through France and Germany, and he knew the French method used by Bremontier, an engineer that was responsible for deforestation of thousands of acres in dunes uh, in the north of France. And basic, the French method is to plant beach grass, to use fences and then to plant pines to transform the dunes into forests and to transform that useful, useless land into forests. And we can understand the importance of this measure 
If we think if that for more than a century in Portugal, the authorities invested time, men and money to immobilize the dunes. Three different regimes, monarchy, republic and dictatorship, invested in this kind of works. This means that the dunes were really a dangerous for people in the 19th century. But we'll return to the dunes. This is some examples of dune immobilization in Portugal. I said that the sea or the shore was a place of fear, but we are not afraid of the beach. We like going to the beach. Everybody goes, likes to go to the beach. That means that in some point in history, we change our perception about the sea and the shore. And that happened in the end of the 18th century in the north of Europe, mainly in England and in France. With the development of the cities and the Industrial Revolution, the, the high classes started looking for other places, for their um, more healthy places. And at the same time, doctors started to prescribe sea bathing as a medicine at, for therapeutical reasons. So, in the end of the 18th century in England, the maritime waters and the maritime air were understood to be good for health. And kings, noblemen, and the bourgeoisie started to go to the seashore in the summer. And this made that the coast, that inhospitable and awful place that where nobody wanted to live, turned into a pleasant and desirable place. And in the 19th century, seaside resources grew everywhere like mushrooms. We have, a key, we have here some examples of Brighton in England, Scheveningen and Ostend in the Netherlands, and Biarritz in France. We have Cascais, Granja, Espinho in Portugal, Cape May, Long Branch, and Atlantic City in the United States. Like I said, nobody was living in those open coasts, or only fishermen during the summer. But with this new appetite for the seashore, things were going to change and fast. I'm going to show you an example. This is Figueira da Foz. Like most of the cities in Portugal, it was developed inside the mouth of the Mondego River. And all the shore was deserted, except for this little fortress against the pirates. But then, people start to do sea bathing in Figueira. And then, it started to grow. And in the 20th century, all the front sea of Figueira turned into a big city like this. We also can see that in New Jersey. If you look into the map, you can see all these dense urban areas in those narrow barrier islands. Well, I'm studying coastal zones, but I'm in Kansas City, so I didn't have much opportunity to go to the beach around here. But one month ago, I was stuck in Miami, and this is the only coast that I've seen from the United States since I've been here. We built cities like this in the coasts in just a hundred years or less. And that brought us big problems, huge problems, in fact. And one of them is coastal erosion. Coastal erosion is when the sea takes more sand from a beach than the, the sand that it leaves there. And coastal erosion causes the retreat of the coastline. And this can cause the loss of land with economical value, 
the loss of properties on beaches and on cliffs, and the flooding of the interlands. And in low elevation coastal zones, it increases the vulnerability to coastal hazards like storms and hurricanes. This, I'm going to give you an example of Portugal. This is the first historical, well-known case of problems of coastal erosion in Portugal. This happened in Espinho, a seaside resort created in the 19th century. In the end of the 19th century, the sea started invading the city. They call it sea invasions. And it destroyed the city, and it destroyed almost all of this. In here, some of the images of the beginning of the 20th century. And these images are from Furadoro, a village in the south of Espinho in the 60s. New Jersey, because it's so near New, New, Jer uh, New York and Philadelphia, was the first coast in the United States to have an intense recreational development, especially with after the appearance of the automobile and the construction of roads and bridges linking mainland and the barrier islands. New Jersey was also the first coast in the United States to have problems of coastal erosion. In, the fact, in fact, in the, in the 20s, the loss of value property was big enough to brought attention to this problem. And the authorities of New Jersey decided to create a commission to study coastal erosion. And they made two questions to that commission. What changes, what were the changes in natural conditions that could explain the erosion? And what could they do to prevent it? And the commission, after their studies, concluded that there were no changes in natural conditions. In fact, they couldn't explain why coastal erosion was happening. But they said that by building groins and seawalls, they could protect New the beaches of New Jersey from coastal erosion. So in the next years, New Jersey started to construct seawalls and groins to, store, to shore stabilization. And this happened all around the world. This is an example of Portugal. We turned our sandy coasts into rocky coasts. And as you can imagine, it's not very nice to jump from here into the water. In the summer, they have some sand. But this brought us more problems. Two American scientists wrote a great book called The Beaches Are Moving. And by this, they meant that the beach is always changing. In fact, a beach is a dynamic system that needs to change to survive. And I will try to explain this in a very simple way, because I'm an historian, so I cannot do it in a complex way. A beach is mainly sand. And that sand is carried by the currents, the sea currents. And sea currents bring sand from rivers, um, cliff in erosion, other beaches or offshore. And during good weather, waves bring the, the sand into the beach. When there is a lot of sand, the dunes are formated. Dunes are mostly a reservoir of sand for a beach to use when it's needed. And they work as buffer zones. When a storm comes, it attacks the beach and the dunes and takes that sand, a part of it away, but the other is kept in here, in the underwater bars. These bars that are formed during the storm help to prevent that the uh, Big, the waves that are coming after, well, they will break first in here, and so they will attack the beach with less strength. 
after a while. And after the storm, when the good weather returns, all the sand in the bar returns to the beach. This is what happens in a normal beach without man intervention. The sand is always moving. When we have a beach like this, and a storm came, the, wa the waves have a lot of space to run, to spread their waters and lose their, wa their strength. And in here, there is nothing to destroy. But when we build seawalls, what happens? When the waves came, they beat against these rocks with all their strength. Sometimes they can overlap the seawall, and then they return back with all their strength, taking all the sand that was still in here. And after some time, all these rocks will be removed by the sea because the waves keep all their strength when they attack the beach. Well, we don't have a beach in this case, and that's the problem. What happens when we build groins? This is the case of Figueira. We have talked about this. This is the coast of Figueira in the beginning of the 19th century. But then they built jetties to keep the port of the harbor of Figueira. And so the sand that is carried by the sun currents, the sea currents in this direction, is now kept in here because groins and jetties work as sand traps. And you can look in here and say, wow, what's a great beach. This is really a good buffer zone when storms attacked. In fact, people living in Figueira do not like this. They have to walk a lot to have a bath in, in here. But the problem is not in here in Figueira. The problem happens in yards. This is the south of Figueira, we have here the harbor. And this used to be big, huge fields of dunes, that dune, those dunes that nobody liked. Well, these were all dunes. And what happened when they built the jetties of, and the, in the port? The coast started to retreat. Why? Because all the sand is kept in here, and only a part of it can cross and so all these areas in here are starving. They don't have enough sand. So in here, in the town of Kova, they have to build new groins to maintain some of the, the sand, to trap some of the sand. And with these groins, they cause more erosion problems to the other cities down here. So when you build a groin, normally your neighbor has to build one too. Because if you are trapping the sand that is going in this direction, everybody has to, want to have one to at least have some sand near their door. But sometimes that is not enough. As we can see here, even with the groin, the sand is not enough. It's not enough when, because if a, a storm attacks this area, this kind of sand cannot protect all that is built in here. And in the summer, people come here, do not have enough space to put their towel and all their stuff. And so, after the Second World War, before that I want to say something. In fact, in the 20th century, we have a real problem with the lack of sand. We have less sand arriving to our coasts because most of it used to come from our rivers, but it's now trapped in the dams that we built on the rivers. So it's just not a problem from the coasts, it's a problem from all the territory, in fact. Let's continue. After the Second World War, the Army Corps of Engineers, responsible for all the buildings of groins in the American coasts, decided and understood that groins were not the best solution because they were causing more coastal erosion and they were not solving the problem of lack of sand. So they decided to do a met another method that is called more cooperative with nature. It is called beach nourishment. This is an example of Portugal. And it's beach nourishment, it's mainly 
you get sand from other place and you put it on a beach to fill the beach. And this is quite useful and it works and it solves the problem of the lack of sand. But it has big costs because this sand is not going to stay here for long and the beach will need to be re re refilled after three or five years, each three or five years. And this has huge costs. All of this, groins, seawalls and beach nourishment have big, big costs. Coastal protections brought us a lot of problems. In fact, the presence of man in, coast, in coastal areas brought us a lot of problems because we only have coastal erosion problems if man is building on the coast. And when you start protecting a beach, you cannot stop because normally, if you build a groin, people have a false sense of security and they will build more houses, more bigger towns. And so those groins cannot disappear. They have to keep maintained because otherwise they will be destroyed by the sea. And if you look into a long-term perspective, in some cases, the costs of protection can become superior to the value of what is being protected. We built all these groins, seawalls, and we did beach nourishment. But if you look into the history of the Atlantic coast of, in America, we'll see that this, the 20th century is a century of disasters. Uh, this is not exactly to read everything. This is just for you to have a notion of the big storms and hurricanes that hit the coast of the, Atlant North, the Atlantic coast of the United States and the losses, the economical losses of all this. When we talk about natural disasters, we, don't, we talk about the natural event and human factors the way people or societies respond to that natural events. And we talk about risks, the natural, and vulnerability, the human factors. And if we are talking about vulnerability, we have to consider three factors, exposure, resistance, and resilience. So, People in the 21st century are more prepared for coastal disasters than in the past. Are they less vulnerable? Have they learned and adapt? If you look into resistance, we can say that we built groins, sea walls, we pumped sand. We have into the beach, we have more capacity to prediction, monitoring, warning, and evacuation. So in terms of resistance, we are more resistant than in the past. If we talk about resilience, the capa capacity to rebuild, we have insurance, we have state and financial, uh, state and federal financial support, we have more technology, we have more economical resources to rebuild than in the past. But, but if we, we look into exposure, our ancestors avoid the risks of the sea coast by not living there. But in the 20th century, people moved into the coasts. In fact, the New Jersey counties, the front sea counties of New Jersey increased in the 20th century almost in 900 percent. So what happens is that because we are moving to coastal areas, the total damage to communities and loss of life increased over the 90s because we have more development we, and we have more people living there. So people turn themselves more vulnerable by exposing to coastal dangers by deliberate risk taking. And in the future, we have to consider 
the mean sea level rise and global climate change, because the sea is rising, and according to scientists, we will we'll have more storms and stronger ones. So what solutions do we have in the future for coastal zones? Well, in areas that are very developed, I, don't, I will not say this is the only solution because we have more than one, but I think that the solution that people will use is holding the line. And holding the line needs, means building more protections like groins and seawalls and beach nourishment to protect that, that it already exists. The other solution would be retreat. Simply abandon it and leave it to the ocean to destroy. But this is a very political, it's a political firestorm that remains emotional, controversial, and largely unacceptable. But we have to keep in mind that to keep our cities, our towns, exactly like they are today, this will cost a lot of money. And I don't know who's going to pay for that. So scientists think that in some cases, technology may not be the best solution. And preserving or establishment of natural systems can be more effective. And they have shown us a lot of so have a, a lot of combinations. They are not, there is, there is no one solution or the best solution. We can think about several approaches, several solutions that we can implement in coastal areas. We have talked about beach nourishment. We also have zoning and land use regulations like imposing a maximum density development not to allow reconstruction after dam of damaged structures after a disaster. We can also, also create construction setbacks and to prohibit any development, sea yards of established line to create a buffer area. Also, one of the prepositions is the acquisition by the states of private properties in hazard zones to leave them development free. This can only work in the United States because in Portugal all the sea coast is public domain. It belongs to the state. We don't have private property in the coast. I left the solutions, well, I wouldn't say the best ones, I would say my favorite ones because they remind me that history is always present, even if we, are, we do not think about that. So let's return to the dunes. Do you remember those bad dunes that nobody wanted? Now they are our best friends against storms. Well, because they were always the solutions for the beach in their natural um, they were always the natural solution for a beach to recover. So now we are trying to use that to help us during storms. So in many places, people are rebuilding or preserving, rebuilding where they don't exist anymore because they were destroyed by man, or they are preserving dunes where they exist to act like a buffer zone against the storms. But the dunes are not a panacea. They will not solve everything. Because we have to have big dunes to protect us from a storm. The biggest the storm, the biggest the amount of sand that you need to protect it from that storm. And in places like New Jersey, you don't have enough space between the houses or the towns and the sea to have big fields of dunes. So they have those narrow dunes. That's good than nothing, but it's, got not, it's not going to save them in case of a big hurricane. But if they have space for 
big dunes, that will be good. And then the other solution is the elevation of structures, placing houses on pillings, allowing flood waters to pass underneath. And that reminds me that in the 18th century, the fishermen that used to live on the Portuguese coast during the summer, they had houses like this. In fact, until the 19th century, all the houses on the beach in Portugal, in those open and dangerous coasts, were like this. Because they could be rebuilt every year, and they let the sand and the water pass. They were built in the dunes, and the, the dunes could move free underneath them. So we, have, we are still using the same kind of stuff our ancestors two centuries ago used. And then the other one is re relocation. Moving houses away from hazard zones. This is the first image of my presentation. It's an hotel in Seabright, New Jersey. I don't know if it's New Jersey or New York, I'm sorry. Um, and it's being the attack, under the attack of the waves. And what did the, the owners decide to do? Well, they moved the hotel far away from the sea. And by this, they protected the hotel. And this is a very good solution. But again, in places like New Jersey, in that narrow barrier islands, we don't have enough space to remove the houses from near the sea. So our big coastal issues are mainly man-made. This is why history matters in coastal issues. Most of the people that went to the coast to live in the coast in the 20th century did not know the environment, did not know the place where they were settling because they had no memories. And this is why it's so important for us to keep our memories. And if you want that the public to have an idea of the dangers that they are incurring by living in coastal areas, we have to keep these memories about our relation with the coast. And we have to understand our, how our actions contributed to the enhancement of natural risks. And then, like Cronin said, it's an historian, an American historian, the past can also help us to remind that whatever we do in nature, we can never know in advance all the consequences of our actions. The proper lesson of such complexity should be to teach us humility. Humility and constant attentiveness to that which we do not know. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Raise your hand. I'll come by with the microphone. As a point of information, there is an article uh, in the New York Times today on the op-ed page about the scarcity of sand in this country. No, because I'm always collecting information about the coast and pictures and everything. So the New York Times? Okay. Do you know if I can see it online? Um. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I enjoyed the talk very much, but I have a comment on possibly changing some of your titles. The reason being that these are not 
natural disasters. They are natural processes, much like a flowing river that people live in the floodplain. We have pictures now of people whose homes are being consumed by lava because they live on a volcanic island. So what I'm suggesting is that you strip the term natural disasters and put the term disaster linked with human, and you have done a magnificent job of doing so down through the history of the time period you're talking about, I'll say the last two or three centuries. During that time, a knowledge of natural phenomenon has grown, largely because of the evolution of the field of geosciences. And basically, I see your talk as a powerful one, but put the blame on the stupidity of man, the failure to utilize what we know, instead of calling the family that has lived in the floodplain for three generations, and we say they show pluck by going back. That's stupidity, not pluck. Anyway, I enjoyed it very much, and uh, uh, I hope that you'll uh, get lots of coverage on that and maybe even convince some people to move away. That's going to be difficult because I found it's very interesting, but most of the bibliography that I've read in here, it's from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, so nothing of this is new. But people always put the rhetoric in rebuilding and Sometimes it could be a stupidity. Yes, why are they rebuilding in the same places that are going to be destroyed by a hurricane in 10 years? Well, but it is, there is some programs, I don't know if they are working or not, uh, that will try to convince and pay for people to build after a storm in other places. The most scaring about this is all the plans. I read a lot about this, and all the plans are due are to well to prevent. We cannot prevent. We can minimize hazards, uh, but then all the plans are for after the storm. So it's like we have to have a big storm that destroys everything now and now we can start from zero or we can prevent people from rebuilding over there but it's like almost first we have to destroy and then we can act and implement the good plans that's terrible <laughs> and oh sorry just about natural disasters well i know there is several different approaches to natural disasters and in some case people call them man-made disasters but that can be confusing because some are really man-made but others have the natural events underneath so i use natural disasters and try to explain there is always two factors the natural element and the human element. It's the way people react. Because if a flood or a hurricane um, passes to a, a place where nobody is living, it's not a catastrophe. It's a natural event. So it only becomes a natural disaster. It's only a catastrophe or a disaster when we human beings are mixed with that natural event. The United States government subsidizes an insurance system for people who live on coasts to allow them to rebuild. So I guess the implication of your talk is that that should be abolished. Is that right? I think that the insurance should pay for people putting their houses in other places. That would, should be the most advisable, 
I'm missing the word here, um, because in port, it's every in all the places that I know, it's the same. We are paying for rebuild in places that we know that is going to be destroyed again. And at some point, we will not have enough money to rebuild, or to rebuild all those protections, because people think they are secure behind a seawall, behind near a groin, but they aren't. And at some point, in that, in that already happens in Portugal, because with the financial crisis, we don't have enough money to pay for the maintenance of this kind of art engineering. And I know that in the United States, that is being put already, because all the American states are paying for to protect the coast, but there is a lot of states who don't have a coast. So should those citizens pay for a house that someone has in the beach in New Jersey? I don't know. Your information, um, there's a good example of uh, proper uh, coast management. East uh, on Long Island, east of New York City, is a stretch of marine uh, beach which has been in a state park for many years. And in the 80 years I've been on this earth and have been going there, basically has, has remained unchanged because nature has been allowed to live there. And the seagrass and the dunes that the seagrass holds keeps the ocean at bay and people go there every summer. You have to drive there. There are no houses. There's some limited facilities for, uh, for people to use, but uh, they have maintained the beach and the beach stays there. That would be the best solution. One of the American scientists who wrote the beaches are moving said, the best infrastructure to have in a beach or the best house to have in a beach is a tent that you can move when you go back. It could be something like that or like the Portuguese fishermen houses where they lived in the 18th and 19th century. Well, they leave the houses there and if they were destroyed they would rebuild them again when they returned in the summer. But that those houses didn't create a fixed line in a moving beach, and that's what we have to change. Or the sea will change it for us. Mm -hmm. Right, due to the time, this will have to be the last question. So thank you again, just to reiterate, it was a phenomenal presentation and very eye-opening. I think for me anyway, what was most um, compelling was that one slide that you showed the economic impact of all of this um, rebuilding and and uh, evacuation and all of these different efforts and I'm to me I, I, I challenge the notion that this is stupidity it's I think it's it's a very conscious choice that's motivated by greed you know I mean there's an economic model from the insurance companies to um, you know ensure people that are in extreme high risk locations and subsequent to that or in, in parallel the developer that are building these these structures whether um, you know for, for business or for residents uh, in these high-risk locations and commanding these you know astronomical prices to get in to get in this luxury hotel to get in this luxury high-rise to get in this you know estate on the ocean I mean I, I see it in Southern California along this Pacific Coast Highway which used to be stunningly beautiful untouched and now it's just one McMansion after the other and now the um, the cliff side is completely disintegrating into the ocean and and it's, it's heartbreaking. So, I mean, to me, um, I loved your solutions. I loved the way that you've just simplified these very, you know, complicated um, um, sort of geo-specific concepts. But um, 
I, I just, I really wonder with the, the way that our economic policy is shaped and the way that our, um, um, the, the way that laws are, are now sort of put in place to, 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 to demand sustainable practices are embedded in day-to-day -day business. To what extent is, is, is government policy shaping this this effort to prohibit further development, further reinvestment, further insurance infrastructure to continue and perpetuate this this ridiculous and harmful um, practice of of um, this coastal occupation. I guess leave it there. But, um, probably me. No. Oh. I think that at least the governments um, are more, the state's government are more aware of the dangers and they are trying to do something. But really the economical interests in these areas are huge. So probably we'll, we'll have to have a big catastrophe for something change. Because people only react to that. We heard recently that we have to decrease our levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, and we know that nobody is going to do anything except when big problems started to eat us. So it's going to be the same. People will try to do a little bit uh, like buying hazard zones and settling measures, but that is not going to change much. It could be good in some areas, but it's not going to change much. Not in the United States, not in Portugal, not all around the world, because the problem is common to a lot of countries, and probably only with big catastrophes and when the financial supports of maintaining this coastal development became so huge because of the rising of the sea and the global climate change and then then probably people will start to retreat thank you very much